pure script, you can compile that to JavaScript and then you can run it on Node.js again. Ah, uh, that sounds like you're describing my personal hell. Welcome back to Backend Banner, the show about backend engineering and careers. I'm here today with Sabine. Uh, we're going to have another OCaml episode, which I'm extremely excited about. Last time uh, I had TJ on, and I really thought that TJ was the biggest OCaml shill on Twitter, but then I met you, uh, and I realized you know we needed to do another episode on OCaml. So my first question, just Sabine, how much is is big OCaml paying you to constantly shill the language on Twitter. Well, I, I would say it's a pretty competitive salary for the area. And considering it's a fully remote <laughs> job, I'm I'm actually very happy with what Big O'Camel is, uh, <laughs> is paying me. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You don't have to answer that. Uh, <laughs> no, I but... won't. But I will just say that I'm happy about it. <laughs> no, that's amazing. So you're on the O'Camel team. Like, tell me just a little bit about that structure. Like, what does the structure of, of the O'Camel team even look like? How does it work? So, um, well, there's not not such a thing as the OCaml team. So there's there's a bunch of a bunch of things here. So there's the OCaml compiler, which uh, many people and uh, different universities and uh, companies uh, work on and contribute to. Um, but then there's um, companies like the one I work at, uh, Tarides, who uh, do a lot of work on the tooling, but also not always alone. Um, and I happen to be a team lead at this company working for the OCaml org team, which okay. is a very small team. So don't expect like there to be a ton of people on this team. This is actually a <laughs> tiny team, uh, dealing with the official OCaml website. I'm always interested in, in people's stories who, who kind of come to work on these like open source projects. I'd say large. I mean, OCaml is large enough that like, you know, I used it in school. I heard about it all over the place. It's obviously not the biggest programming language out there, but, you know, becoming a maintainer on a big project like OCaml, OCaml.org, um, it's a pretty big deal. So I want to just rewind now and like, let's go kind of walk our way back up through your story to how you landed, um, you know, working on OCaml. Um, where did you start? Like, when did you first get started coding? Was it in high school, middle school, or the equivalent of that in, in Germany? Well, um, that was that was in the, I don't know, like that was in the early, early 90s. Um, so I got my first computer when I was seven, and uh, it had QBasic, so it was pretty cool. <laughs> wow. I, okay. I actually yeah. had parents who, who would drive me to, to, uh, to some to a few classes and then we would play with that at home and QBasic had amazing documentation so you you could just like go in the documentation look at the code examples and copy these over and uh, just try out things so later I, I did a bit of Pascal I did a little bit of C++ but I was never very obsessively a coder I was I was wasting a lot of time playing computer games as a kid so what, you, so you <laughs> you started with QBasic when you were seven. Yes. That's really early. I think I like opened an HTML file in Notepad once when I was like 11 or 12. And that was the earliest. Oh, yeah. We, we, we did that. We, we, had, we had our own local internet. So we built our own local fake internet. Because, you know, like accessing the internet was expensive. You had to dial up. Yeah. You had to pay a lot of money. You had the modems with the funny noises. <laughs> back in the days um so we made our own internet so we made a fake banking website we had some javascript to 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 do the hover state on the buttons you had to use javascript back in the days yeah yeah it was hilarious um and this is like when you're what 10 12 yeah something like that and i i had siblings who, who also enjoyed this kind of kind of playing around with things inspecting in the browser seeing how things work um yeah. Okay. That's that's amazing. So you you got a really early start with computers. Um, yeah, that's very it, lucky on my part. 
Yeah, no, it's re- I mean, it's really cool. A, a lot of people did. The, the funny thing is, like, there, there's luck there, right? Not everybody got er- started early in computers, but there's also something to be said for like, you know, a lot of us did have early, early access to computers, but just like weren't that interested. It was kind of a, it was it was kind of a nerdy thing to do, frankly, right? And, yeah. <laughs> uh, Turns out it worked out really well for those of us that did kind of lean into the nerdy. Well, yeah, when you don't have friends, you you just do other things. Like, you know, you you play with computers with your siblings. So that's yeah. fine. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's how it was for me as well. Um, okay, so what's next? Uh, where do you go as you get older, like, you know, 16, 17, 18? Well, I drop out of school, uh, which leaves me in a position that I couldn't study. <laughs> And um, I drop out of school after after skipping three grades, after being hailed the gifted kid, and um, wait, hold I was on. miserable at school. <laughs> Those are like <laughs> conflicting things. Okay, so you, it's like yes. you say you're the dropout. It's like ah, dropout, and then you're like, but I skipped I three know, grades. But this is this is so funny. <laughs> like you know, I'm when when you when you when you stand between worlds, or like you stand in both worlds, one foot in both worlds. <laughs> <laughs> which is which is kind of funny because this is exactly what I'm doing with the OCaml community, <laughs> standing with one foot in both worlds, <laughs> in the academic and in the in the shipping oriented world. Yeah. And yeah, so so yeah, I dropped out because I couldn't handle school. My family fled to France to avoid school, so we would do fake homeschooling. Um, we would just pretend to not exist. So you you skipped grades obviously because you were doing very yeah. well in school, like, and, and well, but then you dropped uh, out because of the uh, was it like was it boring? Was it just like a lot of tedious work? Yes, it was basically agonizingly boring, uh, seeing your time time wasted by uh, by school. Um, yeah, I was never doing really amazing at school, so I had pretty pretty average grades except for uh, like math and uh, the hard topics or what people claimed were the hard topics uh the 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 ones where you had to learn i was i was not great but my mother was always very very focused on like oh she she's just bad getting not so good grades because she's so bored so she she was very good at arguing this in order to to get them to to uh accelerate me um but ultimately you, you get put in a very very bad social position when this happens um you, you right. are the youngest in the class. You don't work. Uh, other kids, they say like, oh, she must be working so hard to do this. Why? Yeah. So why is she such a weirdo? Uh, you know, so you you eventually you either I, just get like uh, bullied or um, or some such. So eventually I can only imagine three years France. is a long time when you're a teenager like that's I, I had a friend yeah. in high school that was a year like he, he skipped one grade and was and was like in our grade yeah I, I didn't and it, it was anything. actually just just two years because I I uh, entered school one year late I was a very anxious kid got it so so you okay so you you skipped you dropped out and then is is there university afterwards like how does that transition even work when you yeah skip that's very difficult in and, Germany and, that's very difficult in Germany, actually, because you need to have you need to have abitur, so you need to have a, a you need to have a diploma in order to even enter university. So uh, I figured I would do do external um, um, an external I don't know test, but okay. I failed that one. <laughs> I failed oh, no. that one really badly okay. because I never never learned to learn. I I just failed that one. Then I spent but- two years playing Diablo two. Is it like you were good at learning, but like you never learned to study? Because those are kind of different things in my mind. Yes. Yeah, kind of, kind of, kind of like you, you throw me something and I, I understand that pretty quickly. But uh, studying, uh, why should I study or how should I learn studying at school when um, when basically everything is repeated so many times that you, you uh, I don't know. Yeah, because I, I had a similar thing kind of where like, I, I was pretty naturally good at certain subjects and not so good at others, but like in high school, learning felt really easy. So I never studied. And then when I got to some of the more advanced classes in university, I actually struggled because I was I like, like, like you said, I never really learned to study and, and I didn't have good studying habits. And so it was like, 
looking back on it, I'm like, I think I was like pretty good at learning, at like picking up new concepts mm -hmm. and understanding, but mm -hmm. I was I was really bad at studying, and that's kind of a learned skill. Yeah, that's true. That, that makes a lot of sense. And and I think that I I was very lucky when I finally got to university. Um because because my my partner would would force me to study be like <laughs> yeah, yeah you have helps. to do the homework you you will yeah. do the homework and 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 that was that did a lot of good for me really a lot of good because at some point uh, things pick up and when you haven't done the homework you you are lost it's easy to forget like especially as adults now where like as an adult you're never really forced to learn anything as, as a kid, you're constantly forced to learn things like it, in the sense that there's a lot of pressure, right? There's a lot of social pressure um, to get good grades. Um, sometimes there's even financial pressure when you're a young adult, like in university, because you're paying. So it's expensive. So it's like financial pressure, social pressure. Oh, yeah. This is this is a very much U.S. thing with the financial financial pressure. Yeah, so that's in Germany, true. We do we do uh, pretty much free university, which is wonderful. Um, but yeah. That's yeah, true. but my point just being that there's these pressures and, and I think later sometimes when you're trying to like self-pace, you it can it can be easy to forget that, that the pressure helps. So like in your case, it sounds like you had a little bit of uh, social pressure from your from your partner and, and that can be helpful in some way. Yes, that was extremely helpful. I I don't think I would have done well in university without that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you get to university and you're studying are you studying computer science? Yes, yeah, so I started computer science in a program aimed at um, at kids that were skill, still at school, still preparing for their their diploma. Okay, I managed to sneak in there uh, and was allowed to take uh, to take lectures and and get credit for the lectures. And uh, I just happened to 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 end up being a, a straight A student mostly. So oh, wow. I think like okay. top three of the class and uh, I was putting in the work, you know, I was yeah. putting in the work the first time in my life. I worked harder than I than I worked on Diablo 2 farming for <laughs> uh, unique items. And, and that's actually where I learned work, eth work ethic. So like having to put in work to get something. Wait, you learned the work ethic on, in Diablo 2? In Diablo 2, <laughs> yes. But yes, very much so. <laughs> that's that's in an interesting take. Okay. <laughs> just grinding for items huh yeah like you know you you just have to right you have to do it if you want it you have to do it and and that helped okay. me in university also like seeing oh yeah you have to you you want you want this you have to do this and turns out that getting good grades in university is another fast track in life so i i had dropped out of my old fast track and i got on a new fast track <laughs> By by getting picked up in the university's gifted program, <laughs> yeah, which is which is kind of lucky lucky way of going through life when you um, when you get these kind of connections that they they offer right offer you when you get into such a program. Okay, so it's, you got fast tracked uh, in university, and then what do you do upon graduation? Right, I don't know what to do. So after master's degree, I, I stick around for a PhD and uh, just doing like what I'm what I'm told more or less because mm. I I figure that yeah I'm I'm on a good track here I I should be doing this but in a sense I was was not very very happy either. Uh, the PhD I did was very uh, externally motivated, so it was in a research project, so there was a lot of like pressure structure. Uh, a lot of requirements so it was not the kind of open-ended phd that you would do in the in the states um, so you say it was external like do you mean like there was a company sponsoring it and so there were like requirements and expectations or do you just mean well i don't yeah. know what you mean. tell me what yeah, you mean. So we, we were we were we were in a research project with this microsoft research um so so the scope of the phd was pretty much um determined Got it. Okay, that's that's interesting. I I don't have a PhD, so I'm, I'm always, I've, I've yeah. had several people with PhDs on the pod, and I'm always asking questions like I don't know what's happening. <laughs> yeah. So so I don't know. So so as I understand it, some PhDs are more like okay, you you have a certain interest and you follow follow these kind of interests until you you have enough for a PhD until you have discovered something useful and you published about that. And and mine was not at all like that. And I. 
I don't know. I was kind of okay. kind of disillusioned with uh, with academia or with the prospect of now kinda sounds like going on to p- publish or perish. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like huh. uh, I was just not not looking forward to the prospect of publishing or perishing until getting tenure or something, and I I, I didn't feel I fit in there uh, very well. Got it. So, so what happened? Did you finish the project? Uh, what? Well, I, I got a kid uh, and then I finished, wrote down the PhD with a baby on my lap and uh, spent another year uh, part time as a postdoc. But ultimately, I had the opportunity to go to Carnegie Mellon. Oh, wow. For a okay. research fellowship. So I actually wrote a successful proposal for a research fellowship uh, that was granted. Really? Okay. Yes. But then I did not go. Mm. You're like, no. I've, yeah, okay. Was it because of just, just your kid? Just thinking of, so yeah, mostly because of the kid. Um, just looking at the kind of work ethic you, you're expected to, to show in the US <laughs> compared mm. to here. Is it higher and, or lower? And having a baby with that is is like the the worst time, um, uh, the kind of the worst time in life if you if you want to spend the time with a baby. That that makes sense. So, Wait, so do you perceive the worth eth- ethic in the U.S. as like are the demands higher or the expectations yes, higher? Yes, I think so. I think so. So 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 the exploitation of grad students, from what I hear, is pretty. Oh yeah, pretty strong in the U.S. <laughs> I haven't been a grad student, but is but it? I, like... I don't know. Uh, okay. I mean, always relying on the free food. It's probably better when you are, have a funded research fellowship, anyways. But yeah. Um. But I don't know. I grad students. Yeah, I've heard horror stories. Again, like I, I'm. I was never a, a grad graduate student, but my my understanding is it's like minimum wage server type work like it just it's almost not internship. that bad in germany and in germany we got a we got a decent enough salary actually we we uh so at really? least at least okay. uh when you study computer science and are at a university that has funding you have a pretty good chance to have a have an assistant position at the chair um to do some work on the lectures and uh, organizing the tutors and stuff like that so I wasn't I wasn't starving. Got it. Okay, so it's better better in Germany. Now, okay, so you you, you decide not to move to the states and, and pursue that. Um how do we go from like what's the next step in this journey towards OCaml and functional programming? So the next step is becoming uh well, first first dropping out of the postdoc and saying like, yeah, no, I'm going to I'm going to take care of the baby. But taking care of babies is notoriously boring and, and like <laughs> like the most dullest thing you, you can imagine. Like, okay, yes, you, you sleep a lot, you, you breastfeed a lot, you sleep, you feed, you sleep, you feed, you sleep. And at some point I was so bored and, and found some time to, to go back to one of these old uh, multi-user dungeon games I used to play as a kid. Uh, so these kind of telnet games where people do role playing and um, fighting monsters and stuff and i spent a few months coding for that they had a backlog of some some 5000 issues and i think i closed around 2000 of them wow um, a lot of those were were, <laughs> were things where you just looked at the issue and you checked whether it works or not and you would just close the issue but there were also real interesting bugs to fix there and um Wait, so I want to pause on this for a add. second. Yeah, this is really cool. So there's this game. Is it is it an online? Like, so it's yeah, an open it's source still game? online. The game is still online, actually. It's called Accursed Lands. Accursed uh, Lands. Okay. What language was the game written in? Uh, LPC. Um, so it's an LP mod. So this is basically one of the spiritual predecessors of Erlang, as I understand. Okay. So you have a system uh, where where you have all these players running around in a world. Um, things can crash at runtime, but the system is robust <laughs> against these kind of processes crashing, and it will restart the processes, respawn the NPCs, um, all these kind of things. So, <laughs> wow. Okay. So, but instead of just playing the game, no, you I became to start a wizard coding. on this game. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I became a wizard on this game to build stuff um, since since playing the game was no longer in, in so interesting for me. It was. Yeah. I'm, I imagine. So I always tell people that like finding projects that you're you're really interested in is a great way to not just like practice coding, but like actually start shipping stuff that people use, which can look good on resumes and lead to career opportunities. Did did working on that project like lead into your first professional developer job? Like, was it helpful in any way? Yeah, I think so. It was very helpful in a way because it it helped me see that well you. You can do things like uh, even even after being for several years in a in a graduate student position where I did not really code or or some such I I can still do it <laughs> oh well I can I can learn it like it is it is mind bending still um, but but I can learn it I can do things that people care about and um, and people would recognize that as as something useful. Yeah. Um, but at some point, I, I also figured like, okay, yeah, well, this is this is just playing around. So um, <laughs> you're gonna do something, something, something else now. Yeah. So what was the something else? What was after this this game? The something else was was getting getting into uh, into sewing and into wanting to build uh, a website for for people who saw. Did this? Okay. So <laughs> this, <laughs> this is fascinating to me. So you're into coding. Uh, specifically coding on a game that you enjoyed. Now, was it that you also happened to like sewing and so you wanted to code for a sewing thing? Or was yeah. it just the coding? Okay, it was the first. Well, kind of. This is a very good question. <laughs> because, yeah, I did, I did a little bit of sewing, but I think I liked the idea of sewing more than the actual sewing. <laughs> <laughs> and and coding that was something that I really liked to do and at some point I figured like okay what's my biggest problem with sewing that I would want to solve and the bigger problem was that I have have not very non-standard body proportion so these kind of sewing patterns so the blueprints from which you you cut the clothes and sew them together um they just wouldn't work for me very well, actually mm. pretty, pretty badly. So I figured like, oh, yeah. So is there a technical approach to fix that? And I, I searched and I found like, oh, yeah, people generate sewing patterns to measurements. So, so yes, that's possible. Oh, then let's do a platform with, a, with, a, with an editor where people can design uh, these sewing patterns and sell them to each other or share them with each other. Um, but turns out that like when you have zero front end experience, it's not a good idea to want to do to build a, essentially a, a cat application. So <laughs> it's not not a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> 3D graphics rendering engine. Yeah, I can see how. Yeah, that well, even if it's all just stays 2D uh, and and you have a lot of calculations there, a lot of uh, SVG. Uh, well, at this point, SVG wasn't even that that uh, that ready yet. Yeah. That was 2014, so um, a lot of different times. It, it's so people. It's funny that you bring this up because so I my whole family of in laws are extremely into sewing, um, and in particular, my sister in law approached me in the very classic like, "Oh, you're a developer. I have an idea for an app," sort of way, and it was, "We need to build an app for sewing for people who sew, right?" Uh, and the idea was something very similar. It was like, oh, I like I have all these patterns on paper and if only I could put them in an app and if only it could do all these calculations for me. Um, my suspicion was that there are either A, are apps out there that do this or B, it's actually like a, an extremely tricky problem to yes. solve in a useful way. Did you run into yeah, either so of those it's things? It's answer B. It's answer it's B. B. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> um, Yes, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of potential, specifically with large language models and training, training them in order to to fit clothes. I think there's a lot of potential here, but this is uh, this is definitely not the kind of thing, at least at that point, that you would do as a solo dev wanting to build a bootstrap something. So you you just don't, you just yeah. Don't. That's interesting that you so, mentioned LLMs. Do you mean like you you could just like type out your measurements really quickly and maybe have it generate some sort of output that you could then feed into like a graphical interface? No, I'm 
thinking more like you would consume existing patterns. So load in these existing sewing patterns, load in the pattern pieces, and then uh, have the thing scale things in a way that they fit your body. Ah, okay, so interesting. based on how your body differs from the standard measurements and taking into account like like factors like what is aesthetically good looking because that's the hard problem in in pattern making in sewing pattern making and designing clothes that you want to create some proportions that are perceived as good looking and yeah um, which is a very vague requirement <laughs> yeah, it's but but may but what you're saying makes sense. Like maybe if you have a model that's been like told enough by millions of people what looks good, th there's yeah. there's potential there. Yeah, <laughs> that kind of things. That makes sense. So what happened with the project? Did you actually spin it up and then like launch it to like crickets well, or, or where to go? No, no, that not that one. So I I pretty pretty early realized that yeah, I, this is out of my ballpark. So as as a as a beginner of front end dev, this was out of my my ballpark. And I came across a, a blog post that changed my life, and it was called um, "Why Is There No Revelry for Sewing?" So so yeah, obviously. And, and it had tons of comments of people saying, like, yeah, there should be a revelry for sewing. Wait, I want pause, what's revelry? For I don't know what this is. Yeah, exactly. That's that's where I go. So I see, like, <laughs> boy, everyone is wanting this kind of revelry for sewing. So what is this? <laughs> so I, I went and I, I found that revelry is a website for people who, are, who knit and crochet. And it's kind of a pattern database and, and stash organization tool where people... Uh, record all the patterns they own where uh, there's a huge database of all patterns known to to anyone more or less and to all humanity. the books that contain <laughs> patterns yeah by now i would say pretty much um and and also all the the magazines where that contain patterns and you you could search for patterns that have certain criteria could search all the sweater patterns or the scarf patterns and search for any kind of features on those very detailed database like basically the dream of anyone who loves spreadsheets mm -hmm. um like i like the person who does spreadsheets recreationally at home um they <laughs> absolutely would love this and yeah, so so when you see that and you, you're like, oh, yeah, I love this search. I love that people collecting all this data. This is wonderful. This is like, oh, it's a dream. And and actually then seeing that this is built by one person, so as so a one coder, so not, not alone, uh, but as a single developer, um, then you think like, well, I mean, they always said we're brilliant, so maybe we can do this. Yeah. <laughs> but for sewing. So. And um, turns out that, well, not, not quite. <laughs> Are there <laughs> interesting almost... challenges with sewing? Yes, uh, it's, it's, there's, there's some very different challenges in, in terms of like how people want to search and what kind of things people care about. And people care a lot more about measurements in sewing and they care uh, a lot imagine, more yeah. about style features on, on, on the garments when, when sewing. And, well, and I still was a was a front end developer with no experience. So, right, <laughs> I had never used an, an SQL database in production. Um, I, um, but I figured I'd do it anyway, and I started with Python Django and hacked together something. I had no idea of UX, so I did a very very ugly things that I got feedback from my interested testers on. Who told me like, yeah, no, this is not gonna work this way. <laughs> <laughs> and I was refactoring a lot, so I learned a ton about refactoring. I was in a sense in a lucky position. I was I, I was at home. Um, I was taken care for. I was not starving. <laughs> yeah, so... I had a similar experience with Python and Django. It was my first like web project, Python and Django, and I struggled with a lot of things. Uh, UX, UI, CSS was a huge gap. I was terrible. I also just struggled with understanding, kind of like you said, it had been my first time like deploying SQL to production. I had no idea how anything was working under the hood. Like it all felt magical. Like I was in my CS degree at the time. So like mm -hmm. I felt like I understood, you know, logic and programming, in particular, like procedural programming. Um, but Django to me felt like just a configuration beast of like, well, I just have to configure all these things properly. And then it, and then if I cross my fingers, it'll work. Uh, what, yes, what did you I learn in, in the project? Like what were some of the, 
unique challenges that you ran into uh, with this first web project? Well, unique, unique. I think most of the challenges I ran into were, were anything but unique, but mostly <laughs> user error. And, <laughs> and in, in, in a sense of like, uh, like like when you when you're this kind of person who's who's used to to being able to like fake your way through everything yeah but you really 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 get get onto this challenge and now you have to build something and you you want to build something right because it's a challenge because it's meaningful and because uh well you just want to um so so, so the thing i found is i had to learn a lot <laughs> I really just had to learn a lot. Yeah, yeah. It no, changed that... me entirely in in how how I how I look at other people's work as well. Simply because you have a lot more more humility when you you've been there and you've struggled and you've seen what it takes. Yeah, no, that that makes perfect sense. Now, before we started chatting offline, I'd mentioned that recently I had Carson Gross on the podcast. The creator of HTMX, mm -hmm. and that in this project, this Django Python project that you've been building, you'd actually been introduced to HTMX predecessor, Intercooler.js. Yes. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, that was that was pretty, pretty, uh, pretty funny. Um, well, well, pretty, <laughs> pretty good. So uh, at some point, I, I looked at what I what I was building, and I looked at other social networks. So I looked at LinkedIn. And LinkedIn had this feature where you had these sections and you could press on a little edit button and then it made the section mm. editable and you could uh, and you could, could, uh, could edit your data and save it without reloading the whole page. And yeah. For some reason, I found that cool <laughs> and I wanted to do the same thing. And so, so I did the same thing. Um, that's because it, I found, it like kind and of I found standard... Intercooler JS for that, so which actually worked pretty well already. So. And is that because in like kind of default Python Django like templating language, you're doing like full server renders of the page yes. every time you post a yeah. form? Yeah, you you do the full full page reload you uh, on edit, and and that isn't even bad. But yeah. at this yeah. time, this was a cool new thing, like you know, interactively without reloading the page and not not necessarily not even having a client server application because at this time there was a very strong belief. Uh, spread around in terms of like, oh, you cannot offload this rendering to the client side. You will drain your people's, your, your users' batteries. It will be horribly slow. And yeah, I tried Angular. I tried Ember. And I didn't get it. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think we like simultaneously have overestimated actually how computationally expensive rendering is. Like it's actually not that bad. And I think we've also maybe overestimated how bad full page loads are. They're also not that bad. There's yes. like, there's extremes of that. Like there's certainly applications where page loads are, are not good and you don't want to be doing that. But like, I think in the, in the typical CRUD app, it's actually just not that big of a deal. Yes, exactly. Except like when you have, have someone, someone uh, telling you like they are data entry professional and, and they're telling <laughs> you your UI is not fast enough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then you're like, oh yeah, um, <laughs> you, you need to figure out how to do this kind of thing. But it's not like like uh, HMX would help you there. Or, <laughs> or so. Anything. What's the relationship between Intercooler and HTMX? Are they basically the same thing, just rebranded? Um, I think it's, it's they are. They do have some differences, <clears throat> but uh, I don't remember so well anymore. Like what what, what <laughs> yeah. Intercooler JS was like. So I would have to look that up entirely. Uh, but the entire concept of, of declaratively uh, adding attributes to, to the HTML um, and then having things happen by that, like uh, fetching fetching HTML from the server and injecting that into the template, replacing, swapping out, that, that was already still there. That was very close to the experience we, we have now. That makes sense. So it's kind of, yeah, it sounds like it's almost like the V0 of HTMX. Um, yeah, kind of. That's been my, my perception of it, at least. So far, okay, cool. So you used Intercooler, um, you built this project. How did you go from working on a sewing project by yourself to getting hired at your first dev job? 
Yeah, actually, Tari, this is my first dev shop, my first actual job. Yeah, which is kind of hilarious. Like, I mean, people people on on Twitter they're treating me like an expert, uh, and and the expertise comes mostly from from my own uh, hacking on things and figuring out things and building this this same social network prototype in different languages and frameworks. <laughs> which I, I don't know. I mean, yes, maybe there is expertise, but I don't have a lot of expertise in actually pro deploying to production. So I, the the only only thing I deployed to production was this this Django app and. It was horrible. Um, <laughs> yeah, but anyways, it was it's so horrible. It's actually embarrassingly horrible. Um, though it does some of the things I wanted it to do. So is mine. Every Django app I've ever made is embarrassingly horrible, and I've I've hid them all away. Where no yeah. So them. so at some point when building this Django application, so I was I was ch chaining together jQuery, uh, all kinds of front end libraries. It was a true Frankenstein monster. So at some point I realized, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm building I'm building a, a, a golden cage. Uh, to to be trapped in refactoring this Python and maintaining this mess I created, uh, I, I figured that no, um, actually languages should have types. I, I'm shooting myself in the foot <laughs> all the time because I uh, uh, and in a refactoring I don't have any support from the compiler. Back in the days, Python did not have good type systems. Using debuggers and print it. statements to figure out what the hell is inside a variable. I've been there. Yes. Yeah, 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 but that works. That's fine. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's just it's just slow, is my experience. But yeah, it, that's it works. true. I mean, in Python specifically, in Python uh, with a Django app, that is uh, slow. On a yeah. laptop, <laughs> that is slow. Yeah. yeah. So you decided right. you like types. What, what and what did you do with this uh, with this discovery of, of type yes, languages? Yes, with this discovery, I, I first tried Node.js no with TypeScript, uh, but I, I, I found it. I found this so weird. So this whole callback hell, I, I did not want no part of this callback hell. <laughs> so I quickly moved on after trying a, a few uh, virtual DOM libraries. Uh, then I got to Elm. So hmm. I figured like, oh yeah, let's, let's try something, something more foundational, something more, more functional. Um, I had a pretty nice experience. Like a postdoc would. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. It's very <laughs> postdoc branded, so. <laughs> but it's actually a good language. It's actually very, very simple. It's just like a state machine. It looks interesting and... to me. Like, so let me give you my understanding of Elm and you can tell me where I'm wrong and, mm -hmm. and hopefully it'll also bring the audience up to speed a little bit. Um, my understanding of Elm is basically you've got like your Elm program and it treats like the whole, the whole front end of your application as like, think of it as like a snapshot of state. So I've got like my state yep. for the application. I run it through my Elm function because this is like a functional program that's essentially a giant function tree and it spits out and like renders on the page something and then something else happens and now my state's modified i feed that state back into my elm program it spits out a new rendered page and every time yeah, this pretty, happens pretty just, much. is that like a high level overview of it kind of yeah yeah so so yes, in Elm you have this this one centralized state, and you operate over that. Uh, Any time you change the state, it goes via a message. So okay. you you cannot mutate the state without a message. And the beautiful consequence of that is that you can have a time travel debugger. So when you hmm. when you run the Elm debugger uh, and you you inspect that in the browser, you you can go back step by step to the previous points in the interaction that you had, and you can see where where did you go off race? Where did something go wrong? And this is pretty cool. That is cool. Yeah. Um, so did you stick with Elm or did you move on? Well, no, I, I eventually um, I figured like, okay, well, yeah, that's, this is just front end on, on the one hand side. Uh, and, and what I really need is like, I need something that, that also works, works on the back end. And I ideally in a way that it's the same language so I can share some code like form validation and stuff like that. So I was aiming far too high. Like I'm, I was aiming for, for things, no single person should aim for alone. Uh, <laughs> you should have a team for that. Um, so, so I tried a pure script for a little bit, but I, I got too confused by, by the many types in, in, in the pure script Halogen framework. So, 
Is that also like, front end only, or does it have a? Back yeah, that, end? that's front end only. But but pure script, you can compile that to JavaScript, and then you can run it on Node.js again. Ah, uh, that sounds like you're describing my personal hell. I've done some pure script, and <laughs> compiling pure script to JavaScript just to run it on the back end sounds like the worst time in the world to me. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Right. So so I, I just did uh, to spend a brief time there. So there were some things I liked about Pure Script and others um, that, that just confused me where I felt like, okay, Ellen does it so much simpler. Like I like simplicity. Yeah. The point in writing a system that is maintainable is to keeping it as simple as you can. And mm. yeah, that yeah. was, and then, uh, th that was, that was Carson Gross's tweet this morning was oh yeah i think it was a daily update to remember that if it magically works it can also magically break right the complexity <laughs> the, to the the toll of complexity yeah that's very true yes and sorry i interrupted from... you yeah where did you go next <laughs> no anyways from from there um there i moved on to haskell um haskell was kind of almost so so i had to go through the monad wrangler Basically, um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I went through the Monad Wrangler. That was fine. Then I could write some Haskell. I still don't entirely intuitively uh, so, so have the correct intuition for like Monad transformers and such, but I could follow the instructions and set up web frameworks uh, and database libraries and such. So, so that was fine. It was a pretty fine language. But what, what ultimately put me off a little was the, the huge bundle size for, for the generated JavaScript. So for the oh, okay. Haskell to JavaScript compiler. So I just couldn't see myself shipping a megabyte of JavaScript. That, that was not, not what I wanted. Just one meg? Yeah, it's, okay. yeah, yeah well, <laughs> it, it, it's a more complex application, worse. obviously more. But <laughs> <laughs> I get what you mean. Like very simple yeah. application, you're already at a meg. I, I get that. Yeah, right. And, and and that for me was was a bit of a, a deal breaker, unfortunately, because at this point I wanted to share to share code between the front end and the back end. And I was like, well, this is not 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 practical for me when I want to want this to load in people's on people's phones on a slow connection. I mean, I, I wanted it to load because obviously, if you your page don't doesn't load, they go away. Yeah. That is unfortunate when that, uh, <laughs> that, well, that does I mean, happen. This is, this is just how it goes. I mean, I go away when the page loads for more than three seconds. I'm gone yeah. because they don't have patience. You're lucky if people give you three seconds in my experience. I know. It's like, yeah, one. It's one... so very gracious of me. <laughs> I think I usually get, I usually give people a whole second before giving up. Yeah. See, and that's, that's about the expectation that, that people have now. Yeah. Okay, so you did you did the Haskell thing. It was the it just turned out to be a little slow in production. What's what's next? Well, while I did the Haskell thing, I also write a little Haskell library, um, a little template Haskell library, which proved possibly proved to be useful. So I was I I, I wrote something for persistent Haskell that would uh, automatically add uh, created add updated add so auditing auditing columns to to the database tables. Oh, awesome! Yeah, which which turned out to be quite nice to do in template Haskell. So uh, people always said like template Haskell, it's so hard. And um, well, not for this particular thing that I did. I don't know. Maybe I was just lucky choosing a thing that was simple. Mm. In, in my experience, anything with I/O in Haskell is hard. <laughs> yeah, that that didn't require I/O. So okay, that, that was actually just manipulating pretty, pretty strings nice in memory. Haskell. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. Yeah, so and you... at some point, then I I said like, no, I I have to give up this irrational dream. I have to like get get somewhere. I <laughs> uh, I kind of have to stop doing this because it's unhealthy. <laughs> you you did. This is like the the joke that we've made on this podcast so many times about like never shipping Haskell to production. You truly lived it, not just with Haskell, but with the other functional programming languages as yeah, well. Yeah, right. Exactly. I, I... <laughs> Right, right, and and now I, I, it is such a great honor to be shipping OCaml into production. <laughs> it's kind of like okay, wow, it, it, you can ship. <laughs> you tried every functional programming language. It finally landed on the one that actually no, can no, get not shipped. everyone, not at all. So I was not this this uh, crazy. I was not this dedicated to trying many, but I was aiming for the ones that had community and that had a little bit of ecosystem, at the very least. 
because three that is was all nice of them. about like, Pison. It's it's you got you pretty much got them all. <laughs> yeah, obviously, obviously, Python's ecosystem is a bit of a shit pile sometimes with all of these libraries that people publish in order to look good for getting hired. Mm, the the yeah. kind of code that no one ever looks into. At some point, you you re you recognize them, but yeah. It, no, it's obvious when something is not done for a real reason, right? That's why I always, I always try to tell people, like, if you're trying to get into the industry, the best thing you can do is, is try to do something that's actually useful because it's obvious when it's mm -hmm. just a toy, right? Or it's obvious when it's just done to put on a resume. It's like, yes, you need to put, you need to build something so you can put it on your resume, but you shouldn't build it so you can for put it on resume. your resume. Yeah. That makes sense, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was never building for a resume because I figured like, oh, I'm unemployable anyway. So why should I care about this? <laughs> so, <laughs> there's, there's, we can't go any farther down than here. We're already at the bottom. Yeah, so we'll exactly. We can't cool. go any further. <laughs> we, uh... <laughs> yeah. But then on a, on a chance, like I came across a job ad um, in, in a forum, I think, in some kind of news group forum for, for women in programming. Okay. And, and Taridas, I think Taridas was, was hiring someone looking for a woman. <laughs> so I'm actually if also a diversity hire. <laughs> hey, we take those. If, if it I works, know. it works. Yeah. If it works, it works. Right. Cool. So you got picked <laughs> up by Taridas um, yeah. specifically to work on what? Well, actually to work on compiling OCaml to WebAssembly because I had the kind of kind of PhD background, the kind of academic uh, credentials that would suggest that maybe I'm the person who can do this. And I, I did spend a, a lot of time on like uh, digging up information, collecting information on this and uh, going to the WebAssembly meetings of the garbage collection WebAssembly group in order to, I don't know, do some light lobbying for OCaml. <laughs> <laughs> some light <laughs> lobbying <laughs> i love that <laughs> well, well actually actually i was supposed to 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 um uh to to build prototypes like for for old camel to web assembly backends um but okay. this turned out to be very hard with with kids at home um and very briefly after after i got into tari yes, the pandemic started so the kids were at home all the time it was just a nightmare um I don't know if I could have done it at this point hmm. because it was not my interest. So it was not the thing I, I wanted to do, uh, yeah. writing, writing this kind of deep infrastructure. I mean, it's wonderful. Someone has to do it, but I wasn't the person anymore. So you did it for a, a little while and then you decided it wasn't for you. And then what happened? Yeah. So, so actually I, I kind of low key dropped off, uh, um, I was a contractor anyway, so I was part time. Uh, the briefing was I, I can work as much or as little um, as as is feasible for me. And for for the pandemic, eventually, I just I, I didn't work. So I was at home with the kids. Yeah. Um, I, I ended up starting another attempt of another prototype. <laughs> <laughs> this time in OCaml. No. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. not. Okay. <laughs> At this point, because I, I did not know OCaml. Yeah, I, I just knew like, oh, yeah, okay, these guys are trying to make OCaml popular. I was kind of still skeptical, to be honest. These guys are just OCaml shills. Is, well, no, is, no, is... they're not OCaml shills. So they're, they're, they are actually building the tooling and, and the stuff that is needed to make it succeed. But uh, Okay, very cool. Uh, yeah. But after Haskell, I wasn't just very, very trusting of, of these kind of functional languages with tiny communities. So I went for Rust, obviously. Mm, yeah, as one does. Yeah, as one does. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, obviously, you 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 go for us when you you when you, want to you have played the programming game on extreme difficulty your entire life is what I'm learning. <laughs> That's true. I, I I never had a mentor or anything like that. So I I went into ICQ chat rooms. I looked at code of others. I'm very self sufficient. Maybe to the point of that I shouldn't be so self self sufficient <laughs> and should maybe like go out more and ask people more, uh, even though it may look make me look stupid. This is another thing. Well, like when you come from academia, you you really have to overcome this kind of fear of looking stupid. Yeah, <clears throat> that makes sense. No, I actually think that to be honest, most people lean too far the other way. 
uh, of trying you know, to playing take the safe. easy road. Yeah. And, oh yeah, and, the, the and easy road. Yeah. When like yeah, no, f- th- fuck the easy road. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, like I, I've I've met so many people that that like without even a starting point, we'll just ask like super vague questions in communities. Like, how do I learn Python? It's like, come on, like you could spend at least oh, a little fuck, time you just researching. Learn it. You, like, you just go. do a project. You... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, like, I don't want to discourage people from asking questions. I, I run a community where no, people no. ask questions. It's great. But like, you got to ask specific questions. You got to put in some work, right? Um, you may have taken it in the, the other extreme, uh, but there's, you know, there's good things about about doing research on you and you learn, you learn a lot. Yeah, okay, apparently. so what happened with your Rust uh, your Rust project? Well, uh, uh, I, I had a Rust, a Rust uh, backend and a Svelte front end. Okay. So going with the hot tech that was on the rise, but with a significantly large community. So the kind of decision that you could defend in business. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I found Svelte Kit pretty, pretty cool, actually. Um, but when you go for two languages that are um, different on the front end and back end, mm-hmm. you, you always have the problem of like connecting them. You, um, yeah. Uh, you have so much opportunity for making mistakes with your APIs uh, not matching up uh, your 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 calls from the front end not matching up with with what the handlers on the back end provide. So uh, that's a wonderful rabbit hole to go down to. So what do you do? You write some code generation to generate you some uh, API bindings for the front end, a TypeScript obviously because mm-hmm. um, Svelte Kit and TypeScript that that's workable. Yeah, and for the back end, uh, write you some uh, code gen, use some um, some handlers, wrapping the handlers from from the back end web framework in a way that is entirely type safe. I'm pretty happy with that one. So that, that no, was that's... a good rabbit hole to go down to, because it's it doesn't suck as much as Open API. Um... <laughs> yeah, I've been I've been there. Yes, you've been there. You fell into that. I I looked at Swagger and such, uh, and and I I I couldn't. It's, I I couldn't. <laughs> so so my my career for the most part has been almost exclusively Go development on the back end. A mm-hmm. um, little bit of Python, a little bit of Node, but mostly Go. And it's this exact problem, right? Which is I write extremely type safe code on my back end, but the minute I want to transfer data to the front end, I have to do it via JSON and JavaScript, which is not strongly typed. Um, so to be honest, like for example, at Boot Dev right now, we're going the back end TypeScript on the front end. We just don't we just have not done the tight coupling um and it's not the end of the world but it would be nice to have the to have the type safety and so we're looking into what we're probably going to do is have some kind of code generation that generates typescript interfaces for all of our handlers and then we can import those on the front end Um, yeah that works wonderfully actually which like yeah works great um but it's like this extra step Right, so I get right. It's an extra step. It's more code to maintain, so you want your code gen to be as simple as possible. Actually, a wonderful use case for OCaml, as I've recently found porting my code gen to OCaml. So my code gen was originally written in TypeScript. Since I was using TypeScript in the front end, it made sense to to just not introduce more languages. So you just right. keep with TypeScript, model the API spec in TypeScript, and then generate front end TypeScript bindings, back end uh, Rust wrappers. Uh, actually, I went to Startup Weekend and I, I found some guys to play Startup with for a while, like really play Startup <laughs> in a sense. And, and, and the other guy, he was a Go developer. Oh, so cool, yeah. so I, uh, I changed my, my code gen to also emit backend Go wrappers for, for Gorilla, which, which he was very, very happy with. So he, he, was, he was new. So it was his first backend first web backend he wrote and now he works at a company and he says well the thing we use at the company it's so much worse than your coach and and i was like oh my god that was so sweet (laughs) for people who have not worked at actual companies or large companies i feel like one of the things that is the biggest slap in the face is like you have no idea as a junior dev just how bad the code at, at, at like companies that are making millions of dollars is because like developer experience, like developer experience, good code, clean code, do not directly correlate to successful business. <laughs> and so like yeah, you'll go get hired not. at that this, first job and you'll be like, now. this is a shit show. <laughs> like <laughs> my my toy project had better DX. It's like, yeah, well, you know, it's easy to have good DX with a toy project. Yeah, right. Exactly. When you're doing this for fun and when you're taking the time to do it properly, 
obviously that's going to be different than in a rush job where people put a prototype in production and then they have users and they cannot yeah. cannot waste the time to fix this up and it's uh, yeah I, I i i have very little experience with that to be honest but uh, not everything is is beautiful in OCaml land. So we also have bad code bases. We have great code bases and we have bad code bases like everywhere. This is practic a practical yeah. uh, engineering. <laughs> so. Yeah. So how did you go from this, this, Rust, this Rust Svelte project to actually being on the OCaml team? Yeah, this is... Uh... <laughs> But it has nothing to do with the Rust and Svelte project, definitely. Ah, okay. <laughs> but at some point, at some point, Tari just reached out and was like, "Oh yeah, now the pandemic is over. Maybe, maybe you want to come back." And uh, and I was like, "Yeah, yeah, I want to come back because I was already getting burned out again on my my side project." <laughs> um, it's like I can do like eight months or so, and then I I I'm I'm ruined. I my head is full, and I can't do any more. Yeah. Um. But they asked me like, oh yeah, you, you want to come back? And I was like, oh yes, I want to come back. <laughs> and, and and I got put on on the compiler compiler runtime um, to to do some work on the compiler runtime in order to to ease me into uh, into generating WebAssembly. Got it. So okay, I, cool. I did a bit of that, and uh, but I, I I didn't really feel at home in the compiler runtime, so it was not not my thing. At some so point, I had a critical career uh, conversation. <laughs> 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 but where I told people like, "Hey guys, this is this is I I can't do this. Um, it's it's not working. I'm I'm not the person you need for this. Yeah. Uh, but I am a person who could fix up your shitty website. <laughs> <laughs> well, not not like this. I, I I said it much more nicely because I'm actually yeah, a nice yeah. person when when I'm not not talking shit. So, um, <laughs> nice when not on Twitter. like like on yeah. Twitter. I'm on Twitter. I'm talking a lot of shit. So um, it's the only um, way to do I'm, I'm actually. Usually, usually pretty nice. So what's but the yeah, relationship? I, I told people, I told Sorry, people that yeah, I've I've been seeing the website language and I have the skills to fix that. So there was stuff like broken layouts, um, uh, alignment problems, styling problems, problems with button sizes, the kind of UX thing I had been struggling so hard for so long to learn properly. Mm -hmm. um, that you finally picked it up. <laughs> yeah, I did. I mean, I mean, I started with Bootstrap and CSS, and then went over um, over different frameworks. <laughs> Just always changing, re re redesigning, <laughs> until yeah. I wrote my own CSS from scratch in in Zas. So, wow. I, so I had a very similar story. Like it, when I was in school, like my CS degree, I, I was probably one of, if if not the worst, one of the worst like UI UX designers, like be, not even like the worst at writing the code, but also the worst with like an eye for it. Like thinking things look yeah. okay when they really truly don't. Um, and I kind of pride myself on like, now I actually feel like I've gotten to a decent place. I'm still not like a world-class designer by any means. Um, there's this really great book called Refactoring UI that I read and that I think helped a lot. It's like UI for developers. Um, lots of, like, yeah, for me, for me, it was something thumb. else. So for me, it was the, the Gary Simon videos. Gary Simon. So there's this, this guy, a design course, uh, the design course guy, uh, Oh, cool. He has okay. a bunch of YouTube videos where he does rapid redesigns. So I, I have to shill him because he's so cool. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I think I've seen one or two of the YouTube videos. I need to, yeah, I'll check this out. It's it's like this kind of thing where he, he redesigns 30, 36 websites in an hour and you, you don't get bored. So usually when people try to teach me something in, in a YouTube video, I get bored and I click away. And But yeah. this guy, he, he speeds it up and then he talks why he's changing that. And this this is changes everything for me. Yeah, no, that's why. really cool. Design course. My my entire career was just in back end, but in order to launch boot dev and have my own project, like you got to write mm -hmm. some CSS at at some point. Um, yeah, or you have to pay something someone for it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, cool. I'll, I'll definitely check that out. Okay, so you started doing UI UX. Was that for OCaml.org? Well, um, like in what sense? Else? Um, so on on OCaml org I do I do pretty much everything from from features uh, feature additions changing the back end the front end uh, fixing up problems and now I've actually become a, a bit more of a maintainer uh, opening issues for for people to contribute on. So 
Tardis, Tardis is a company. Yes. And they are, if, well, explain to me the relationship between them and like the OCaml programming language. Cause like every programming language is like sponsored and maintained in a different way. How does that work? Yeah. So, so Tardis does a lot of work on the OCaml compiler, but even more so on the OCaml tooling. So thanks, thanks like Dune, um, uh, package manager, um, OPAM and, uh, all kinds of other things like OCaml format, so auto formatter, um, LSP server, editor integration, these kind of things. So that's that's a lot of what Taridas does. Um, gotcha. Taridas does, does a few other things, but primarily mm, this kind of work gets funded by Jane Street. So Taridas oh, does a lot okay. of tooling development for Jane Street, and Jane Street also funds community projects that Tari does does on, on the OCaml tooling for, uh, for the wider OCaml community. Got it. Okay. Very cool. So just by kind of by being like, by being hired by Tari does, you're very close to the whole OCaml ecosystem. Yeah. And, yeah. It's, and... it's just like a miracle. I mean, I don't know how, how I got here, except that it's kind of chance. Yeah. Lack no, of, that's luck of, uh, being in the right place at the right time, knowing the things that they needed for OCaml org. Yeah, no, that that seems to have worked out really well. Now, I want to ask you a couple questions about the language itself because we've we spent a good amount of time on the story, yeah. which I thought was fascinating. <laughs> no, like I'm so glad we did. Like, you don't get stories like that every, like you know, getting into programming, postdoc, dropping out, skipping three years of school, like so fascinating. Yeah, I, I keep thinking like I live my life as if someone should make a movie about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to do it. It gets you on the yeah, podcast. Maybe. I don't know. At least there's sure. no regrets, you know? At least there's no regrets. Yeah. So what do you think of the language level that you like don't like and wish it was done a different way? Well, I mean there's there's things lacking, like like debug printing. Hmm. But there's a kind of kind of a thing that, that could be added and should be added and like more easy easy debug printing. Yeah, okay. That makes sense. Like it's just hard to print in line. Is that what you mean? Um, you have you have these kind of algebraic data types where you you kind of these sum types and such, but they don't come with a built-in way to print them. So that's all that they would have to add in in the compiler. Oh, interesting. Um, okay. So so right now we're we're using a lot of like deriving uh, in order to to generate uh, functions that that allow to render any type to a string. That mm -hmm. works, but you have to manually annotate the deriving, and, and you have to for that you have to install a PPX. Um, it's not as integrated yet as Rust in this regard, Got but it. but it's possible. I mean, it's it's possible. What's the one thing you like most about OCaml? What wouldn't you not want to change? Well, um, this is a good question. <laughs> um so one thing one thing I, I would not want to change is is the the type system so uh it's it's really pretty well done and uh specifically the type inference so many times you you don't have to annotate a function mm. with types because the compiler can figure it out so when you specifically when you're developing, when you're prototyping something and you're playing around with, with the design and changing things around a lot, um, this is pretty nice um, to to not have to update types in too many places at the same time while you are still changing things a lot. Later when you when you when you finalize that and you say like, oh yeah, this is good, this is done, then you you have your your type definitions in a separate interface file. Mm. Um, so, so that you do have type annotations for for all of the functions, um, which also act acts pretty well as documentation. So, so, so in yeah, TypeScript, I think the type inference. You, in TypeScript, the like return value is often inferred from a function, right? Like, well, it's always inferred if you want it to be, basically, right? Like you, yeah. you, you just return stuff, and then TypeScript will see what you returned and like use that as the return type, but it doesn't really do it for parameters. Is that the same? Is it like the same system in OCaml or is it a little Well, different? no, it also infers types for para parameters. So it's, uh, it's uh, strong. Based on all the sense. places it was called in your whole program? Yeah. 
but but usually that's bonkers I could, to me. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, but Ocaml is a pretty Ocaml is a pretty explicit language in a sense. So like it's not not um, like when you when you want to do something something more abstract, you um, you usually do that intentionally, and then you you okay. have a type that is intentionally like has a type variable or something like that. Um, I'm trying so, to, like, so I don't know. It's, it's hard to describe. It like yeah, yeah it's hard so, to like, describe. Let me give an example. So like, mm -hmm. let's say I have a function that in the body kind of expects that its parameters, let's say it just has two parameters, are integers. Like it's adding, like it's adding them together or something. Um, well, is this even yeah. a good example? And then like you call that No, this I is not a good function... example because in OCaml, the addition operator plus is just for integers. So it will know immediately oh. that it's for integers because OCaml has a separate addition operator for floats. So there is nothing to generalize here uh, in OCaml. Well, actually, but that is interesting. So if you so if I use the, the addition operator in a function, it will just yeah. assume then that the parameters are integers and use yes. that to do the inference. Yep. That's pretty cool because, like, I'm pretty yeah. sure TypeScript doesn't do that. It just assumes they're any, right? Granted, the plus yeah, operator yeah. works I mean, for everything in, in JavaScript. The so. is any. <laughs> TypeScript is is insane in that regard, but it has to be. Uh, it has to be, and yeah. and I don't use any. I I don't use any in TypeScript. <laughs> it makes right. me anxious because it kind of like breaks the entire entire shell. Like suddenly, your your protection is, is yeah, like, it's, like, it's <laughs> kind of gone. Yeah, I mean, I've never had the luxury of not being able to use any because every project I've worked on in TypeScript has been like slowly being migrated to TypeScript from JavaScript. So you start with a code base of all anys, and then over oh, yeah. time you're slowly removing some and getting stronger and stronger. Yeah, but types. but that's good. I mean, that's that's where, where TypeScript works. You know, that's yeah. why the anys. That's why it's the anys are useful. This gradual typing. So I I don't necessarily think that gradual typing generally is a good idea, but it's it's a great scheme for getting JavaScript developers learn a statically typed language. Yes. So it's a great great way to to onboard existing projects into into this thinking of like oh yeah static types are actually useful. Yeah. No. It did I a lot of good more. in it's... this regard. Yeah. Well, and it's I mean it's super productive at least for us. E even if it's just mm -hmm. even if it's just adding like um interfaces to all of our api calls like that alone is like the biggest benefit in our project um and it's not it's yeah not it's, it's, it's documentation essentially like you can click yeah. through and then you see the type definition you see like okay this is what it what it looks like um it's helpful i, I find yeah. it helpful cool one last question for you about like the engineering stuff what's your most unpopular opinion just when it comes to software engineering like what does sabine believe that that nobody else seems to be talking about enough well i have a very unpopular opinion about the okamu community but <laughs> <laughs> but about software engineering is really really hard because i don't think there are really such unpopular opinions um, I think you always find a, a group of rabid zealots who who will say like, "Yes, this is what we believe in." <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know. A, a lot of, I think there's a lot of unpopular opinions, if for no other reason than so many opinions in in program in programming happen to have like a fifty fifty split or a seemingly fifty fifty split. Yeah, uh, yeah, but then you have two popular opinions. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's uh, that's true. It depends, I guess, on where you draw the, draw the line at unpopular. <laughs> yeah, probably, probably. I don't know. I, yeah. I don't. I'm not. I'm not even a, such an opinionated person. I, I just like uh, like databases. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you've tried every. Uh, I know you wouldn't tried say every functional programming language, but I would just because if we count the long tail of functional programming languages, like no, no, it's it's endless. It's, it's endless. endless. I, I have. And and I have never tried them in the way that someone who really wants to understand the language does. I always have tried them in in terms of like how would a person try this who just wants to build something? That's who the just wrong way to use care. functional languages, to be like that's not that's not what we do. I don't here. know. I think it's the right way to use <laughs> functional languages, uh, but or, or like the right way to use any language is to find the subset of the language that is readable, understandable, and maintainable. I think that's the the really the 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 challenge with every language. I agree. Yeah, that, that's and, going and to some people, in every For some people, it's more like, oh, I want the mastery over the language. I want to understand and use every language feature. 
but I have problems with that because when you use every language feature, you require everyone else on the code base working on this uh, to know every language feature. This kind of raising the bar in a way that's not necessary. That's also yeah. why Go, in my eyes, is a pretty good language simply because it has such a low ceiling in terms of features. Uh, you, you, the, the people who want to go deep in mastery of the language, who want to use every feature of the language and deploy it to production, they, they are going to get bored with Go. They move on to other languages <laughs> where they can do that. And, and that leaves you in Go, the people who are just focused on like, oh yeah, we don't really care about these deep, deep uh, language um, explorations, but we care about shipping. And I love that. So I, I really, yeah. really want to onboard Go devs to OCaml because that's the spirit that OCaml needs. That's the spirit. I love that spirit. I, I need to do more with OCaml. Yes. And actually, I think that is an unpopular opinion in certain circles. And what I mean yes. is, um, and it's important to point out because I, t I work with a lot of like new entry level developers, particularly learning back end. Um, and there is an assumption that to be a really good developer, like you said, you, you want to spend time mastering every nook and cranny of a language. Um, and in languages like JavaScript and Python, like I am of the belief this is a fool's errand. There are way too many features, most of which you don't care about. And most of them, even if you did know about them, you would probably, like, <laughs> if you know about them and you're a good engineer, you probably want to ignore them, right? Yeah. Um, because it's just been cruft built up over like 30 years of, of adding language features. So, um, and I do think that even with a language as simple as Go, like Go is famously simple with how, how few features it has. It's not that you get, it's not that you learn all the language features, it's that you learn what you can do with them. And like, for example, concurrency in Go, there's a few language specific features like channels, mutexes, well, that's not really language specific, but channels, right? And you can understand what a channel is in just a day or two of working with channels, but to understand how to build like maintainable programs that work with channels, like that's years and years of mm -hmm. practice. <laughs> so, well, imagine the years and years of practice learning how to use channels in Rust. <laughs> so you don't just have one channel, but yeah. you have 10 channels, <laughs> and then you have 20 mutex types or something like that. I mean, I'm, I'm observing that firsthand. I mean, I've never done this, and, and this is not a rabbit hole I will ever go down to. But, but I, I have someone here in the house who's writing, writing an embedded system on uh, some, some kind of Rust web application thing. And uh, let me tell you the questions about ch uh, channels <laughs> <laughs> and async. I mean, it's, it's wild. This should not be so hard for, for a simple web application thingy. Um, I mean, yes, if you need the utmost maximum performance, then you get it with Rust. You, you absolutely yeah. get it. I mean, you Go will never be that fast. OCaml will never be that fast. Uh, but when it comes to shipping some, something fast, I think the Go's and OCaml's of this world, they, they have a leg up in this. So yeah. there's just, it's just so much simpler to, to write code in, in the presence of the garbage collector when you, you have, have a single channel type and a single, <laughs> single kind of mutex or well, the handful of mutexes that are actually useful in practice and meaningfully different and not related to being meaningfully different in terms of ownerships and, um, and right. memory management. This has been so much fun. Thank you so much for coming on, Sabine. Where can people find you? Where can people find OCaml? What are the resources that you want to plug the most? Well, I, I obviously hang on, on Twitter. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I also happen to hang out on, on the OCaml.org GitHub repository. So OCaml, OCaml.org um, a lot. I sometimes open issues, but currently it looks like the demand for, for, for these issues is much higher than the number of issues that I can create. Uh. Uh, just like because people are currently interested in learning OCaml and it is kind of a cool way to learn OCaml when you can contribute to the official website. It's kind of cool, right? I mean, I, I would be tempted if, 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 if I weren't working there. That's really cool. So th the issues are actually getting closed faster than you can op open them. Am I understanding correctly? Um, yes. Yeah, so so um, I only recently learned to write good issues. So I've never been an open source maintainer. I was always yeah. a very much a proponent of closed source in terms of like when you're a solo dev, well, the least, the last thing you want to do is give people access to your code. Yeah. 
you know, you, you obviously you use open source and sometimes you contribute back a little if the opportunity presents, uh, but, but usually you, you are just closed source. But Taridas is very much an open source company and uh, yeah, it's a cultural change. So I've never been a maintainer yeah. before. Um, growing into that role is super interesting, like figuring out like, how do I need to write this down? Like, what do I need to tell people? What's the outcome of the task? What are, what are, what is, how, how can you do this? Right. I don't know. Very cool. Well, go follow Sabine on Twitter, ocamel.org, ocamel.org, GitHub. Um, great. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Yes. Thank you for having me. That was so fun and also so interesting. <laughs>